Let's take a mathematical approach to understanding Darwin's model of evolution by natural selection. In this section, I'll show that if three conditions are met, evolutionary change must result. This makes the conditions sufficient to cause evolution. Moreover, each condition is required because lacking any one of the three will make evolution impossible. These are three conditions that are both necessary and sufficient for evolution by natural selection to occur. The first condition is phenotypic variation. Note that it's variation and not phenotype, that's the noun here. Variation is a property of a population of organisms. Phenotype is a property of a single individual organism. In the case of right arm length, you have a phenotype, but you don't have variation. Your right arm is as long as it is. In a class of students, we can measure right arms on all the class members. And if everybody has exactly the same arm length, that would be no variation in phenotype, right? But if people had differences in arm lengths, some longer, some shorter, that is what variation means. You have to have variation in order for natural selection to operate on that phenotype. If there were some factor that caused longer or shorter arms to be favored by natural selection, maybe if we had to reach into hollow trees or storm drains to get our food, this would favor longer arms. It could also be that selection favors shorter arms if heat loss from extremities were a problem because we lived in a cold climate. If anything like this were to happen, it could lead to a population evolving, but not if everybody's arms were the same length. You have to have phenotypic variation in order for there to be something for natural selection to act upon. We typically show the variation in the population with a frequency distribution. On the x-axis, we plot phenotypic value. Shorter arms left, longer arms right. On the y-axis, we plot frequency. Usually in natural populations, the most common phenotypic values are those closest to the average, while the more extreme phenotypes are rare, and the result is a bell-shaped or normal distribution. In a typical normal distribution, there is a mean or average value which is in the middle of the range and has the highest frequency. It's the most common. We use the lowercase Greek letter phi for phenotype, and by putting a straight bar over the phi, call it phi bar, that's how we identify the value of the mean phenotype. Variation in a normal distribution is shown by the fact that we have different values of phi in our population. If there were no variation, for example, if this were arm length and everybody had the same value, then this normal distribution would still have a mean, but there would be no width. It would be just a straight line up the middle. Very little variation would be a skinny tall bell. Lots of variation in a normal distribution would be a broad flat bell. All of these normal distributions have the same phi bar, the same average. They differ in their width. To quantify the variation, we will use the standard deviation, represented by the lowercase Greek letter sigma, which is about two-thirds of the distance between the mean and one extreme value. So like from here to here. A wider, flatter curve would have a larger standard deviation, while a taller, narrower curve would have a smaller value for sigma, right? Okay, now back to our three necessary and sufficient conditions. At this point, we've accounted for the first, phenotypic variation. The second condition is basically described by the word selection, selected as opposed to random. The condition is that there has to be a non-random association between phenotype and successful survival and reproduction. Remember Malthus? Based on Malthus's essay on the principle of population, Darwin concluded that only a fraction of individuals born into any generation actually make it to maturity and then also successfully reproduce. This condition requires that survival and reproduction is not random. 
certain individuals have a statistically higher likelihood of surviving and reproducing. And knowing the phenotype of an individual, you'd have some information about that individual's chances of successfully being a parent to the next generation. Let's take our class arm length example. This second condition requires that the phenotype you have, your arm length, correlates with your ability to survive and reproduce. So if there was no such correlation, if everybody survived and reproduced with equal success, or if only a fraction survived and reproduced successfully, but there was no correlation with arm length, then you'd say that this condition is unmet. And I think obviously, if there is nothing that favors arms of a particular length, then you couldn't expect there to be any particular evolutionary change from this generation to the next. On the other hand, if we had to get our food by reaching into hollow trees, maybe to rob the acorn caches of squirrels in order to get our food, then individuals with longer arms would be more successful at surviving. And by measuring someone's arm, you'd have information regarding their chances of being a parent to the next generation. Longer? Somewhat higher chance. Shorter? Less of a chance, right? This is selection, the second of our necessary and sufficient conditions. Directly above the phenotypic distribution and using the same horizontal axis, we'll draw a second graph for fitness. This is the likelihood of survival and reproduction, represented by a capital W. Remember, this lower graph gives the phenotypic distribution for the entire membership of the population at generation T, that is, before selection has had a chance to act. Now, this upper graph gives fitness, the expected chance of survival and reproduction as a function phenotype. This phenotype here would be at this frequency and it would have this chance of surviving and reproducing. So if I draw the fitness relationship like this with a line going downward, that means that the lower values of phenotype, shorter arms in our example, the expected rate of survival and reproduction, that's fitness, is higher compared with phenotypic values over to the right, longer arms associated with lower fitness. If I draw the fitness curve like this, with a hump in the middle and lower values both right and left. This means that the extreme phenotypes, super long and super short arms, are poor for survival and reproduction, and arms of intermediate length are best. You could also have fitness rising on both ends and lowest in the middle, a bowl-shaped fitness surface. We'll talk about all of these in an upcoming lecture, but for now, Tell me what the fitness curve should look like for the situation I described before, where a big part of our diet comes from nuts that we have to steal from squirrels by reaching deeply into hollow trees. So I hope you said that it would be an upward sloping function. It doesn't have to be linear, but that is how I'll depict it here. These guys with the longest arms will have the best access to the greatest amount of food and should do better than those with medium length arms. And they should do better than those with short arms. This graph shows that relationship. What would the fitness graph look like in the absence of selection? That is, if condition two were unmet. Well, arm length would have no predictive value for survival and reproduction so everyone would have exactly the same expected fitness. The fitness graph W would just be a horizontal line straight across. Anything but a horizontal line, sloping downwards or upwards, humping in the middle or bowl-shaped, all of these are examples of a non-random association between fitness and phenotype and would satisfy the second condition. Now, Let's say we have this situation where longer arms are favored. This phenotypic distribution, the bell-shaped curve, represents variation in our population before selection. In other words, it includes the individuals that are going to succeed in surviving and reproducing, as well as those who will not. 
What happens if we apply the filter of selection and eliminate those individuals who do not survive, who do not reproduce, leaving only the ones that will actually survive and become the parents of the next generation? These over on the left, forget it, shorty. Die, die, die. Survive, but don't reproduce. Note that this is a statistical relationship. There could be a shorter armed individual here that survives and reproduces, or a longer arm here that dies. These occurrences that are off the expectation are going to happen. They shouldn't surprise you. But nonetheless, if you look at only the survivors and successful reproducers out of the whole population that we started with, their average arm length would be bigger than the average arm length of the entire starting population. Now in mathematics, when you make a frequency distribution, you always normalize it such that the area under the curve remains the same. We'll draw the frequency distribution, but just for the survivors and reproducers. These are the successful members of Generation T, the ones that will be the parents of Generation T plus 1. Their average arm length is greater than the average arm length for the whole of Generation T before selection. This means that, for sure, their offspring, Generation T plus 1, will have a greater average arm length than the whole pre-selection Generation T, right? Well, actually, no. And here is where we bring in that third condition, completely necessary, the heritability of phenotype. Because in our arm length example, if phenotype were not heritable, that is, if longer armed parents did not pass anything on to their offspring that would make them longer armed, then even if we were to have only the individuals with the longest arms be successful in reproducing, their offspring would not inherit the tendency to have long arms, and thus you wouldn't expect to see any change in average arm length in the next generation. However, if arm length had even some degree of heritability, for example, if there were a genetic component determining one's arm length, then whatever genes tend to confer longer arms would be more represented in the selected parents and also more represented in the next generation, the offspring of those selected parents. At this point, you might ask, aren't all phenotypes heritable? What would be an example of a population that has phenotypic variation that is not heritable? Good question. I'm glad you asked. I'll illustrate this with a sort of extreme example, but one that's also realistic. Say you were a corn farmer in the Midwest. In order to maximize the efficiency of your farming operation, you want to have as much uniformity in your corn plants as possible. Plants that are the same size and reach maturity at the same time, making harvesting easier. In order to maximize your profits, you want there to be as little variation as possible in your stock. So you buy corn seed that is genetically uniform, probably highly inbred, from a commercial supplier. If you were growing bananas instead of corn, you'd probably use genetic clones for your plantation rather than planting inbred seeds. My point is that you don't have to search very far to locate a population in which there's effectively no genetic variation. The plants in your cornfield would be a prime example. But let's say that within your cornfield, there are some spots that get just the right amount of light, water, and fertilizer, and other spots where these resources are either lacking or overabundant. Maybe you don't irrigate or fertilize evenly, so there are spots that are excessively dry or excessively wet, unfertilized or overfertilized. Consequently, you end up with a lot of phenotypic variation in your genetically uniform corn plants. For example, some plants will be taller than others. So the first condition is met. You have phenotypic variation. It's also completely possible for you to select only the tallest plants using their seed to plant the cornfield next year. Second condition, met. But since all the plants, short and tall and everything in between, have the same genetics, you wouldn't see any change in average height for the offspring of these taller plants, right? They're taller, but not because of any factor that could be passed on to their offspring. 
And so, even though we satisfied conditions one and two, the third condition of heritability failed, and so no evolution took place. Heritability is not a yes or no thing. There is a spectrum of possibilities, ranging from zero heritability, like with the corn example I just gave you, to complete heritability, where genes are in complete control of phenotype. If you were to think about something like plant height in a natural population, where there's both variation in the environment that the plants experience, as well as genetic variation, a plant could be tall because of the environment, call this nurture, or because of its genes, call this nature, or some combination of tall genes and environment. The greater the effect of genes, the higher the heritability. The greater the effects of a variable environment on phenotype, the lower the heritability. In the real world, genes are important as sources of phenotypic variation, but environments are also quite variable. So heritability is usually non-zero, but also never complete. So if the mean phenotype of the selected parents from generation T are this far from the original mean for the generation, their offspring, the generation T plus one, would not be as extreme as their parents. I'm adding a level below the first two on our graphic to give the phenotypic distribution for the next generation, T plus one. Here is the mean of the phenotypic distribution from the previous generation before selection. Here is the mean of the selected parents. If heritability were zero, the offspring would be identical in mean with the original generation T. With complete heritability, the offspring mean would be the same as their parents. Heritability is likely to be incomplete, so the phenotypic mean of the offspring will be somewhere in between the two. We'll call the average phi bar prime, the average phenotype for generation T plus one, and it's somewhat higher than where the previous generation was before natural selection, but not as extreme as the selected parents. But the fact that the mean phenotype of the population has shifted at all from generation T to generation T plus one, this difference in phi bar, delta phi bar, is the average at the start of generation T plus one minus the average at the start of generation T, and here it's a positive number. This slight increase in average arm length across a single generation is the evolutionary change resulting from natural selection. By satisfying all three of the conditions, the result of some change, evolution, is the outcome. It's not an issue of there may be evolutionary change. It is what must happen if all three of the conditions are satisfied. This is the fundamental mechanism of evolution by natural selection, Darwin's major contribution to our understanding of the natural universe. Across a single generation, the actual evolutionary change may be minuscule, too small to be detected by statistical analysis. But if the same natural selection were to be sustained over a large number of generations, then the cumulative outcome could be substantial. Darwin envisioned selection in nature, that is, natural selection, to be pretty weak. Maybe on average, the actual change from generation to generation would be only one one thousandth of a standard deviation. I couldn't use selection this week on my graph, you'd never be able to see differences between the means. But visualize this same graphic, but with the differences between the black and the red and the green being much closer together, a couple of hundred times closer than what I've shown here, and you'll have the idea. You couldn't really see the difference between phi bar and phi bar prime, but if the same selection were to occur over 1,000 generations, after that time, the average arm length of our population would have moved over to the right by a full standard deviation. In the long history of natural populations inhabiting the world and experiencing natural selection, a thousand generations is really not that much time at all. The entirety of the Cenozoic era, 
the time within which most of mammal diversity has unfolded, is 65 million years. And this is only the most recent of the geologic eras. The entire history of life we now know extends about 4 billion years into the past. Darwin's mechanism accounts not only for change, but also for adaptation. Remember, the world needed an alternative to Paley's inferred watchmaker to explain life's apparent design. Now, after even one generation of natural selection, this population is incrementally better suited to its world relative to where it was in the previous generation. Our population of slightly longer armed organisms is slightly better off compared to the same population just one generation before. But arm length is just one dimension of evolutionary change. With variation, selection, and heritability in other phenotypic characters, natural selection shapes organisms to be better and better at meeting the challenges posed by their world. Over time, this leads to organisms with phenotypes so highly suited to their ecologies that they could appear to be designed by some intelligent being, though in reality it was this completely naturalistic, impassionate force of natural selection that shaped the organisms into their current state of being. Move over, William Paley. Yours is not the only game in town anymore. So Darwin published On the Origin of Species in 1858, and in it, he detailed this basic mechanism, supporting it with a mountain of strong arguments, including a lot of analogies with artificial selection, known well to animal and plant breeders. As expected, there was considerable backlash from established religion. There still remains backlash today, though none of modern-day creationism has any scientific merit. During Darwin's day, however, there was a serious issue that had the potential to invalidate Darwin's model and he was fully aware of the problem. This problem had everything to do with the first of our three conditions, phenotypic variation, and the last, heritability. It should be very clear to you at this point why phenotypic variation is necessary. But in Darwin's day, our understanding of inheritance was based on the mechanism of blending. In blending inheritance, the hereditary factors of each parent are mixed together to form an intermediate hereditary factor to be carried by the offspring. If you were a yellow frog and your mate were a blue frog, your offspring would have hereditary factors that were a mixture of blue and yellow. This sounds kind of reasonable. We know that offspring resemble both parents and are often thought of as falling somewhere between the two parents. The problem with blending inheritance is that with offspring being intermediate between their parents, any phenotypic variation that exists in a population would be quickly eliminated under random mating. If frogs range in color from yellow to blue, with all shades of yellow, green, green, blue, green in between, two frogs mating at random would have offspring that are intermediate in color between the two parents. The most blue frog would not have completely blue offspring unless it happened to mate with another blue frog, and this would be rare under random mating. So the blue frog's offspring would be greener, the yellow frog's offspring would be greener, and the extreme values of completely blue and completely yellow would disappear. And over the course of generations, the frogs would become progressively closer to uniformly green. Blending inheritance is incompatible with Darwin's model because it results in phenotypically uniform populations, that is, populations lacking phenotypic variation. As I said before, Darwin was fully aware of this problem, and he devoted a great deal of wasted energy to addressing it. He was pretty sure that his model was right. It had to be. The evidence in support of evolution by natural selection was so strong, and yet, to his knowledge, there was no hereditary mechanism that would account for the continued existence of phenotypic variation in populations. What Darwin never knew was that in 1850, that is, eight years before the publication of The Origin, 
Gregor Mendel had described a model for inheritance, we call it genetics, that would come to completely allow for a sustained phenotypic variation. If you think about the classic Mendelian example with purple and white flowered pea plants, it's obviously not blending inheritance because the cross between purple and white gave us purple flowers, not lavender. And then in the F2, we recovered both fully purple and fully white flowers. Impossible under blending inheritance. Blending inheritance, it seems, is not a thing. Mendel made a strong case for this, but it was published in an obscure journal that never made it onto Darwin's reading list. Mendel's work was, of course, rediscovered, giving rise to the discipline of genetics in the early 1900s, after Darwin's death. It took some mathematical firepower in order to show the connection between Mendelian inheritance and its implications for the preservation of heritable phenotypic variation. Three mathematical wizards of the early 1900s, Ronald Fisher, J.B.S. Haldane, and Sewell Wright, are credited with proving mathematically that the facts of Mendelian inheritance resulted in continuous phenotypic variation that did not disappear over time. In other words, blending inheritance was a dopey idea, and how had we been so stupid not to see this? The one apparent flaw in Darwin's model of evolution by natural selection had been a non-issue all along. And once this had been demonstrated, Evolution by natural selection became the ironclad, bulletproof, and totally foundational piece of understanding needed by anyone and everyone in the life sciences. In the years that followed, each of the subdisciplines within the life sciences was subject to a necessary overhaul. Up to that point, biological studies was largely descriptive. We discovered new facts about organisms and their processes, but we didn't have the context of why things were the way they were or how they got into that state. Now we had that context, evolution by natural selection, and it required us to rethink our respective disciplines. The era from the 1930s to 1950 was characterized by the publications of major books that established a new beginning for each of what we now think of as subdisciplines within the life sciences. Before this time, it was kind of like different fields, botany, paleontology, systematics, genetics, each doing its own thing, loosely connected with each other in some undefined way. Then came Fisher, Haldane, and Wright, and then people realized that their fields were actually part of an interconnected fabric through the common theme of evolution by natural selection. Theodosius Dobzhansky a Russian emigre escaping the oppressive intellectual atmosphere under Lysenko, who was Stalin's science minister and a hardcore Lamarckian. Dobzhansky came to the U.S. and became the father of modern genetics with the publication of his book, Genetics and the Origin of Species. Ernst Meyer wrote Systematics and the Origin of Species, the book that basically carried taxonomy from its earlier state of descriptive classification into a legitimate science by setting the context of common ancestry and evolution. George Gaylord Simpson published Tempo and Mode in Evolution, which laid to rest any of the older Lamarckian ideas that were bandied about in the world of paleontology. The list goes on. Historians recognize two waves in this period of growth in biology, the first of which was the marrying of Darwin's model with Mendelian inheritance when two separate ideas or theses are brought together to form a much more powerful thesis. This is referred to as a synthesis. Fisher, Haldane, and Wright were the main players in the first synthesis. The second wave occurred when people like Dobzhansky, Meyer, Simpson, G. Ledyard Sebbins, George Williams, and others brought about a second or modern synthesis bringing together every sub-area of biology under the common umbrella of evolutionary sciences. I started out by showing how Darwin's model of evolution by natural selection made biology a science. It's the collective work of all of these subsequent players that has made the biological sciences 
a cohesive tapestry of interrelated disciplines rather than independent, unconnected areas of study. Dobzhansky is credited for saying that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. If you're going to study biology, you must understand the evolutionary process, and that's why this course is a required part of your class list. As I write these lectures, the world of science is moving in the direction of de-lionizing celebrated scientists of the past who are known to have expressed racist, sexist, or otherwise unacceptable sentiments during their lifetimes. Georges Cuvier is known to be overall a connard véritable, and so it's not too surprising that he was also a promoter of some racist ideas. One other name in this lecture that will be under hard scrutiny for years to come is that of Ronald A. Fisher, who was an active supporter of eugenics. I know that Sewell Wright published at least one of his major papers in the Journal of Eugenics, but I'm not aware that he was particularly sympathetic with the movement. Darwin? Well, he was influenced by Karl Vogt, not mentioned in this lecture, and Vogt had promoted some very racist ideas and is one of the figures in the history of biology whose memorials are falling like the statues glorifying members of the Confederacy. Now, in all fairness, it would have been really incredible for any white dude in the 1800s to be truly woke in the sense of 2020. You may remember Darwin was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln. They were both born into a world in which slavery was a common thing. I can say with moderate confidence, though, that Darwin was not as bad as he could have been. For one, Darwin was without question an abolitionist. In his writings, he advocated for the emancipation of slaves, not as a dispassionate scientist, but in the expression of his personal viewpoint as a human. Later malignancies like social Darwinism and eugenics took inspiration from Darwin's work, but it would be unfair to hold this against Darwin himself. The eugenics movement, for example, didn't get started until after Darwin's death. That said, though, a certain stain on Darwin's name with these later movements is real. The term eugenics was coined by its early champion, Francis Galton, who was Charles Darwin's cousin. Things are definitely complicated here.